Welcome back to Chaos Corner. It's your old buddy, the guardian of chaos, Big Daddy, and I tell it like it is. I'll say that to say this. Here, live to tape, same day coverage, show number 45, down in the bunker, 20 feet below the surface of the earth. There's a lot of breaking and trending news in the IWC. There's a lot of news coming out of last night's show for AEW Dynamite. And here on show number 45, that's what we're going to cover. The fallout from last night's AEW Dynamite. And we'll go through news and notes. Not only that, this weekend, a big pay-per-view that's pertinent to all the companies like AEW, New Japan, the NWA. And that's Sacrifice and Impact Wrestling this weekend. I'm going to briefly talk about that pay-per-view and the big match for the unification title of Impact and TNA. We're going to have a lot of fun here on show number 45. It's me, it's me. It's the GOC. Follow me on all social media platforms here on the YouTube channel. Go to Twitter, and that's at Big Daddy GOC. And the GOC stands for the Guardian of Chaos. If you hit my profile link, that's going to kick you over to here, the Guardian of Chaos YouTube channel. Follow me on Twitter, YouTube, Gab, Parlor, DLive, Twitch, Rumble, Instagram, Facebook, and of course, my boys over at The Show, and that's at Mario underscore chaos. If you're not following them to put yourself off or to rub the spot, branding, whatever it is that you want to do to put yourself over to get recognition, I don't know what the hell to tell you. I don't know what you're doing in the IWC. They're here to help you at The Show. Here on this channel, we have over 700 classic YouTube videos. Anyway, with that being said, stay here. We're going to have a great time. We'll keep it about an hour, under an hour. Uh, go back and watch show 44 where we ran over Revolution. Fans, you're not going to want to miss it. Stay where you are. We're down here in the bunker with the Guardian of Chaos. We're going to have a great time. You see the music is on. So I'll say that to say this. Come on back for AEW coverage. Don't you dare miss it. All right, guys. We got through the opening two minutes and 20 seconds monologue on uh, Twitter, which is probably our number one channel for social media. Let's adjust uh, the music here. We're getting a little crazy. We do have a small crowd today. We're here on an unbelievable Thursday. It's sunny outside again. The weather has been trending. It's we're, we're heading into springtime, and I believe we spring ahead this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. And as I was talking about, a lot of news and notes coming out of AEW Dynamite last night. And then, of course, I covered on show 44 the pay-per-view of AEW Revolution. Go back, fans, and check that out. You're not going to want to miss it. A lot of things came out. Of course, the controversy with the finish of the exploding barbed wire death match and everything that happened between uh, Amox and Omega. But they really addressed it and covered it last night on AEW Dynamite, and that's why I'm here to cover it. I hear it was a big show over at NXT for the WWE, but I'll go back and check that out later. We'll maybe get a review. I'm trying to stick to AEW because that's the hot coverage right now, although Impact... Uh, this weekend with Sacrifice, and I'll briefly run that down here uh, before we get on to the AEW Dynamite last night, which was a great show and a great coverage after the Revolution debacle, which I didn't think was that bad. It was what it was. It'll go down in history. I understand. I get it. If it was the WWE, everyone would be pissing all over it. I understand that, and for good reason, because Revolution left a lot to be desired in certain areas, but I believe Dynamite and what they're moving forward. And, you know, if Khan and everyone just come out and admit it was a gaffe, which they're kind of doing, but they're making it into a storyline, we're going to get on to that. I'm gonna, you're going to find this interesting. I noticed that the views and the likes and the algorithms down a little bit, so I implore you, everyone out there in the IWC and all the content creators and everyone that I follow and that follows me, like, subscribe, put it out on social media. Let's get the views out there. Let's get the algorithm. Uh, here on Chaos Corner, we were flying high, but I noticed that the views are going down a little bit. Is it because of AEW? It's certainly not because of the product. So let's spread the word. I'm going to call you out, send it to a friend. Let's get this out there. Hey, listen, it's free. It's content. It's entertainment. And it's a lot of fun coming from someone who knows what the fuck they're talking about. Anyway, let me get past that. I don't want to get too crazy. So this weekend, it seems like there's a great or a good wrestling event coming up almost every weekend. And with the story of NXT going to Tuesdays, 
I mean, we really have a lot to be looking forward to as insiders and fans and, and smarks and, and just people in general that like the industry or that were in the industry as veterans. It's not a better time. And once we break through the pandemic, which we're lightening up with all the regulations all over the country, I'm hoping and staying positive for good things. And fans, if you don't have your family, family your faith, your fans, your friends, and you don't have positivity in life and you don't have motivation and inspiration to be the best person that you are and put your best foot forward, whether it's good news, bad news, health-wise, financial, otherwise, the pandemic, mental fitness, mindfulness, physical health, spirituality, walking with Jesus, it's all very, very important. If you have that, you don't need anything else. All the other worries will go away. Positivity is the key, and I'm telling you that because I live it every day. And if I can put out that message before we get started here on Chaos Corner, show number 45, I'm going to put that message out there to you guys, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, from the GOC. So again, uh, I've tried to get onto it a couple times. Sacrifice this weekend. It's going to be big for Impact. It'll be on Twitch. It'll be on pay-per-view, Impact Plus. I'm not sure of the platform, but we'll be watching, and they're pretty good at their social media. I'm putting it out there because we know that Impact is really getting the rub from AEW. So this weekend, the Impact champion, Rich Swan goes up against Moose, who's the TNA champion. Now, this is going to be a match to unite the Impact and TNA titles, uh, along overdue with two unbelievable athletes. And I get it. I get that Rich Swan's an incredible athlete, and I get that he's a specimen. He's probably the future. But there's no way, in my opinion, from the chaos Big Daddy view, that he can beat Moose. Moose was a former NFLer. He's adapted well in, into the, uh, the world of, of pro wrestling. He's a beast. He has changed his attitude now and become more aggressive than ever. And he has decimated the Impact roster. In my opinion, I don't care what you say about Rich Swan and all his fans out there. I respect him. He's a great athlete. And like I said, he's probably the future. There's no way and I think Impact and Scott Demore and, and, and the Invisible Hand Don Callis and everyone up there in Canada, I think they're going to give this to Swan. I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I think it should be Moose because out of this, the winner faces Kenny Omega at Rebellion for a title versus title. And now we haven't had that in years. Go back and research your history about titles versus titles and, and Bachwinkle versus uh, uh Flair or or Lawler versus Flair, the different champions, Backlund versus Anoki, all the different champions that have faced each other over the years, and I know I'm missing big ones. You gotta go back and research the inter-organizational, inter-promotional champion versus champions. They're very rare, and we're gonna do a show on that before this happens on April 24th. So that's what you have this weekend. Swan versus Moose for the collaboration uh or the merger of the Impact Unite, the Impact and TNA titles at Rebellion on the 24th of April. I believe it's the 24th of April at Rebellion. The winner of this bout this weekend faces Omega in a title versus title. It doesn't get bigger than that. Also, I'm very interested to see this one for the Impact Ladies title. Diona Perrazzo, the former Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling Ladies Champion, takes on... And I don't really have what she has, obviously, because she's a female and I'm a male. And I don't get those things confused. I know a lot of the world is trying to push it on you and, and make you be confused about that if you're young. But don't be confused. You're born with what you're born with and what you have. And that's what you are. Just my little PSA. So Diona against ODB. I think you could buy hot dogs or pretzels or something on the, or her cart outside before you go in or tacos or something like that. ODB. She's back. The legend. Uh, I don't believe ODB, as a savvy veteran, has what it takes to beat Diona Perrazzo. That's just my opinion for the Impact Ladies title. For the tag team titles, we have interpromotional tag team titles on the line at Sacrifice this weekend for Impact. And I'm sure Tommy Dreamer is going to be around somewhere in the background with Demore to give his influence. I've already talked about that. You go back to previous shows. Dreamer's influence in the locker room at Impact is unbelievable. you got to respect Tommy Dreamer. Here's the interpromotional. The Good Brothers, Gallows and Anderson, who we just saw on AEW, a part of the Bullet Club. They put their Impact titles on the line against the New Japan Pro Wrestling Tag Team Champions, Finn Juice. And that would be David Finley and Juice Robinson. It's going to now remember the whole, when I went back on shows before this here on Chaos Corner, all available on the channel. 
talking about impact and saying how the Good Brothers have this history with Finn Juice, you know, Finley and Juice Robinson over in Japan calling them towel boys or the boys, which means you assist the veterans, carry their bags and trying to make fun of them. Well, here's the opportunity. Title versus title. Gallows and Anderson, the Good Brothers, who I personally like against Finn Juice. Let's see what happens at Sacrifice this weekend. Also, for the ladies' tag team titles, fire and flavor. You see how that happens? And that's not even planned. That's what you get here on Chaos Corner. Fire and flavor. That's what Kiera Hogan and Tasha Steeles do to the Guardian of Chaos as they put their titles on the line. This weekend at Sacrifice against Jordan Grace and the legend Jazz. Now, I think that's going to be a hard-hitting match. Jordan Grace has really stepped up her game. Jazz, enough said about her. She's a pro wrestling legend. And then, of course, the future of Fire and Flava, the current tag team champions, this is going to be one hell of a ladies' bout. I honestly don't see Graz and, uh, Grace and Jazz coming out of this. Not because I don't think they can physically do it. I don't think they're going to put it in the storyline. I don't think they would sell that of having uh, Hogan and Steels lose right now. Although it wouldn't be a bad idea. Because Jordan Grace and, and Jazz can certainly kick their ass. There's no two ways about that. Sacrifice this weekend. No rules match Eddie Edwards against Brian Matt Myers. This is going to be a hard-hitting match that's going to go all over the place. You're not going to want to miss Eddie Edwards and Brian Myers. Obviously, Myers from WWE has done very well for himself in Impact. And Eddie Edwards is a hardcore legend who's been the cornerstone in that company for years. This ought to be a great matchup. Also, in tag team matchups, Big Joe Doring and EY. Eric Young, who I've been singing their praises for quite some time now here on the channel, especially Big Joe Doring and this whole Diener thing and Jake something or Jake nothing, they take on, sorry about your damn luck, James Storb, and from the Motor City Machine Guns, Chris Saban. That'll be one hell of a war at Impact. So that's the card that you have this weekend, Impact sacrifice a lot of big things that have meanings on other companies, especially the connection between Impact, AEW, and New Japan. So I'm going to get off onto that. We're 12 minutes in here on show number 45. Thanks for being here on a Thursday. We're trying to put out the content. We're trying to stay consistent. We're trying to cover the breaking news. Uh, a lot of the fans are excited. after you see that chaos uh, on a personal note? What do you think of a little trim down? Because you know the beard was down to here. Again, I told you I got a couple things going on health-wise, but I'm feeling good, doing okay. Everything worked out fine. I had to trim it down for a couple procedures uh, pending and moving forward, but we're doing good, bigger, stronger, and more chaotic than ever here on the channel. So what I want to talk about now that we'll transition into AEW Dynamite. Last night was unbelievable. Uh, we're going to talk about the War Council. Sammy Guevara returned. Uh, uh, Jericho booting out MJF. And, uh, MJF and his new faction, who people are trying to call the new Four Horsemen, for lack of a better term, because of the people in it. But I, I don't buy it. We're going to cover that. The return, again, to AEW of Christian and what's going on in the fallout with Kenny Omega. So that's what we're going to follow here. Transition over into AEW. Thanks for being here. Let's see what we got. Let's start it off, guys. Let's take a little agua vache break, a little water break. And again, let's get the views up here on Chaos Corner. Let me know what you think about the new beard. Uh, should I put the chains back on? Stay hydrated, stay healthy, stay mindful, stay with the Lord. I don't want to put any propaganda out there. This is just coming from me. You never like dead air. If you can learn anything here on Chaos Corner... Learn my uh, broadcasting skills and linguistic skills that you should never have dead air. So as the start of the show, I feel like Moxley from Revolution, and we've talked about that. There's been a lot of fallout from the whole Revolution thing and people talking on social media and different things. I know, guys. I get it. I don't have a mirror here in front of me. What am I going to tell you? There's always going to be a heckler or two, except for that one show which I think was the last show. We had nobody down here, two previous shows before. I like when the bunker is empty and it's just chaos. No disrespect, no, no, no offense. No, no. Really? Really? Okay, let's get on to the task at hand. Last night, first off, big shout out, AEW Dynamite, the fallout show from Revolution. Of course, JR Excalibur and Tony Schiavone were on the commentary in the booth. 
And then there's my boy. And go out and get his book, Best Seat in the House, Justin Roberts, the AEW ring announcer, perhaps the best in the world. I don't care what you Buffer fans say. And the way he does... Unbelievable, Justin Roberts. And I know you're watching, Justin. Because with that being said, that was the opening bout. Ray Phoenix from the Death Triangle and Pac versus, from the Young Bucks, Matt Jackson. So we know that in AEW, on the Revolution pay-per-view, we know that the Young Bucks defended against MJF and Jericho, and we know now that they will face Pac and Phoenix, the Death Triangle, who won the tag team uh, uh, battle royale, if you will, which was very hectic. So it's nice to see them now, and they open up again. I've said it here for two, three weeks in a row, how AEW opens up hot to get the ratings and the rip and the demographics and the people to the viewers to not change right from the rip, uh, right at the 8 o'clock hour. Very smart by TNT, Tony Khan, whoever's doing it right there. And pretty soon you're not going to have to worry about it, and it's it's just a plus for everyone else because they'll be on Wednesday nights by themselves. So to have Phoenix and Matt Jackson go one-on-one -on -one after the fallout from Revolution and knowing what we have leading into the next tag team title match, it's a nice way to start. And I'll give you the highlights, as I always do, of what I take out of these matches to break them down. First off, and I've said it for the last several episodes that I've covered AEW strictly, Ray Phoenix is the new Ray Mysterio. Maybe even better. That's no disrespect. That's no judging. Ray Phoenix is probably, the, right now, the hottest, most incredible grappler in the world. That's just my opinion. You guys would agree with that. See? I got someone to agree with that. Not that I need anyone to agree. What a match. Here's what I took. First off, several high-risk maneuvers. You know that going in there. The Young Bucks are were ahead of their time as far as what they've done in the business and from the independence into the pros. Pac and Phoenix are two incredible specimens, especially Pac. Phoenix, I already said uh, what I believe about him. Here's what I took out from Phoenix. First off... He hit a Hurricane Rana, Hurricane Rana, tilt the world, uh, whatever you want to call it, off the top rope on Matt Jackson. That was unbelievable high risk. I've never seen anything like what this guy does. A somersault outside of the ring as well on top of Matt Jackson. I mean, Phoenix is just un unbelievable. The innovative moves that this guy has. And then from rolling in, uh, outside into the inside of the ring and then hitting Jackson with a nice cutter. The different moves and walking the rope and running across the top rope like Phoenix does. Fans, if you haven't seen him, and even if you have seen him, appreciate this guy. I don't know about his longevity and his health, but he is amazing and what he did last night and what AEW did to open up the show last night was unbelievable not to take anything away from Matt Jackson the young bucks are unbelievable as we well know Matt hits the bucks destroyer from the outside over the top rope too that was unbelievable uh Pac also hit a Canadian destroyer outside the ring on Matt Jackson from outside interference it just really wasn't fair there that's for sure Matt unbelievable with a series of sharpshooters on Phoenix that nearly cost Phoenix the bout the series of reversals both of these gentlemen are so grapplers technically sound high flyers risk takers and the different maneuvers and innovations that I see from this guy this is where I say, this ain't your daddy's wrestling. This ain't your grandpappy's wrestling. This ain't Big Daddy, the Guardian of Chaos, wrestling. It's really unbelievable what these gentlemen did. They keep showing, they did it, I think, twice. They keep showing Daniels and Kaz SCU in the stands, and they're just sitting there looking uh, and down there in Daly's place in Jacksonville. A Phoenix misses Matt Jackson with a sliding drop kick and hits Nick Uh unbelievable. Matt with a super kick on Pac outside. The outside interference, you knew what was going to happen with these four men. In the end, they super kick each other and they're both out. Phoenix with a pile driver that was out of this world for the pin, his own version on it, and Phoenix goes over on Matt Jackson. That's a lot to be said. What a huge victory for Phoenix over the co-tag team champion what is that set up for the future when these guys face that's a big feather in the cap for the death triangle in a one-on-one -on -one matchup yes a lot of different outside interference a lot of different moves you know the super kick party and the moves by phoenix but in the end for phoenix to hit his version of the pile driver on jackson for the pin uh unbelievable that's how it opened off hot and heavy a great match with two great competitors that's the way i see it 
Then we transition from there into Eddie Kingston and Moxley promo, sitting uh, in a, by a fireplace somewhere, uh, drinking some whiskey, uh, talking about PTSD, uh, Eddie Kingston talking about Rikers and Sing Sing and when he was going to get locked up and it went dark and blacked out and they're talking about revolution and you know they're trying to cover this up. Like I said at the, at the beginning, uh, you know, they're talking Omega, they're talking, blaming him, oh, really, really great exploding barbed wire death match. Uh, oh, who, who are you guys? Kingston's calling them the Joker and, and the Batman and and they trying to blame Impact for, for no explosion. It was a setup, so they're hinting at that and they're really trying to work that angle. You know, it, Mox and, and, and Kingston, you know, like old buddies, oh, I, you know, I got my drinking buddy back. And and then Eddie Matt, and Mox, you know, they're going back and forth and then it cuts off. So you see what they're trying to do with Vignette. I thought it was funny. I thought it was entertaining. I'm not saying I agree with the way they're trying to cover it up, make it into a storyline as opposed to just coming out and saying, hey, we fucked up. But a, a lot of people in the IWC making way too much of this, and AEW rebounded nicely last night. So that's what I took out of that. We go to Cody with Arn and more of a match you would see in the 80s or 90s, like a jobber match uh, against a, a big guy. I'll give him credit for that for stepping in the ring in good shape. Seth Gargas. Uh, Cody, again, demolished him. He looks fantastic. He's out there with Arn Anderson, a figure four for the win. Uh, this guy, Seth Gargas, taps out. Uh, really was a... Uh, I think they need more matches like this, like back in the days, uh, jobber matches, squash matches, and, and no disrespect intended. That's nothing but respect for that uh, coming from someone who's in the industry. Uh, I think they need more of this to build up characters, build up monsters, build up storylines. And this way, more of the boys get to work and learn and pay their dues. Just my opinion. Then we have an in-ring interview with Shivani uh, talking about Shaquille O'Neal and Cody uh, and Arn, but out of nowhere, and no one saw this coming, and I personally loved it. So Shivani's trying to talk about what happened a Revolution with Shaq and Jade Cardgill and Red Velvet and Arn's there, and out of nowhere. You know, they're talking about the heat from the ladder match and all that stuff. Here comes Penta. He interrupts Cody, who he calls... Well, I guess, and he says it in uh, in his language, you know, a little broken. He says it's some Spanish, some English, a little mixture. And he says if Cody's the he's there with the Spanish announced team, I, I forget the gentleman's name. Uh, they've in, in, in intervened, or I want to say innovated that Spanish announced team into the AEW, uh, which I like that, as the WWE does in all different languages. So that's good for AEW. So they're working that angle, the Lucha Libre angle, and this is where... To my point where Penta says, if Cody's the prince of pro wrestling, then he's the lord of Lucha Libre. And the crowd, once again, down there at Daly's Place, the limited capacity, they really make it loud and put on a good show. And they really get the energy from the crowd for limited capacity throughout this pandemic. you got to give them credit. And then the crowd starts chanting, Lucha, Lucha, Lucha Libre. That was awesome. So Penta says, he hurt his arm. So you couldn't pick up that baby girl anymore when it's born. Basically, uh, you know, it's, it was tough to understand it. They're going back and forth, but Penta really relayed it pretty well. And referring to my notes, uh, you know, we know now that Brandy's pregnant. Obviously, that's why she hasn't been around. So what an angle. They worked that into and Penta says, that's why I tried to break your arm in the ladder match. As I said, referring to the heat from the ladder match. Immediately, you know, any family man, any person, storyline, real life is going to react to that. He reacts and jumps out of the ring and tries to go after Penta. And everybody gets involved in the middle of Daly's place. And, it, and it's all out insanity, an all out brawl between Penta and Cody. And I love it. Who knows where this will go from Sierra, Miero, unbelievable Bo Penta. And they did it the right way. I liked how they did it. It was a, a, a nice setup there. And you see the storylines and what AEW continues to do. Although, I don't want to sound like a fanboy, a shill, a mark for the product. They're not paying me, okay? I'm telling it like it is, and I keep things positive. But I will point out the negative as we have our segments of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And although they can be very sloppy at times with rules and refs and tag matches and, you know, everybody slat leg kicks and waiting there for the moves and looking to catch people outside the ring and all the different complaints that everybody talks about with AEW. I appreciate the product for what it is. They're the new kid on the block, and they're pulling it off. So for as they can be as they are, 
building storylines, ring psychology, making stars. That's the flip side of the other part of AEW that your fans have to see. So I, I really enjoyed that. I got a lot of feedback and comments on that. And again, inbox me, email me at any time. Leave a comment in the section. We will talk about it live to tape here on the show. Then we go to a segment with, uh, uh, after that, again, no one saw that coming. Even on all the people in the IWC, no one saw that coming with Penta and Cody Rhodes. So we move on to the next segment with Chucky T and Orange, okay? Cassidy, obviously. A Kip and Miro, and they're in a video game place, Kip and Miro. I'm getting kind of tired of this BS. Well, not Kip and Miro. Let me correct that again. Let me go to the Bully Ray comment that I say on every show. The Hall of Famer, perhaps the best tag team in the history of pro wrestling, said to me on at least a couple of occasions 20 years ago, Give the Guardian of Chaos seven spots and he'll fuck up six of them. I'm proud of that. I consider that to be a compliment. Thanks, Bubba. Thanks, Bully. I really appreciate that. So as we go, it's it's Chucky and Orange, the best friends that are in the video game. Again, I'm getting tired of this stuff. They're all really into this, this new generation gamers and this and that. No disrespect to that community because they follow me. I love you guys, but it's just not my thing. I'd rather play Madden or something like that back to then. I don't know. I'm just saying so they're in there, and they, Orange and Chucky e. T, call out Kip and Mero, and they want to have, and they're thinking about having, and I'm sure they're going to make it up, and they're going to do this, talk about entertainment, it's not everybody's wrestling, a lot of people complain about it, a video game match. Look for that somewhere down the road, as Cassidy and Chucky e. T are hanging out in some video game place, that they're going to try to set up a match with Kip and Mero. I think they need to leave this alone, and need to move Mero into the beast that he is. I've been saying it now for weeks. Just my opinion. Next we go to Tony Schiavone and Sting talking about Darby Allen. We're back in Daly's place. They're at the tunnel where they do a lot of the vignettes on, on the platform. They're on the stage. Schiavone and Sting and the same. Oh, Stinger! Kind of getting tired of that. So Sting's out there, again, talking about the fallout from that unbelievable cinematic match at AEW Dynamite which I thought was really something to behold, as good as the, the Styles undertaker Boneyard match, if not better. Just my opinion, they're on same par. Really stepping out of the box. Never thought I'd see this in my era of pro wrestling. Just didn't, but I appre appreciate it, and they really pulled it off. So he's talking about that. Out comes the Murder Hawk monster, monster, Lance Archer and Jake the Snake. Roberts. So they interrupt Sting, start talking about different things, and then it's, oh, so Shivani's like, you're really going to interrupt? And Murdoch's, oh, okay, I won't interrupt your stay. Well, my, I have my apologies, making it a work, kind of mocking Sting, and says, but in due time, so you can see where this is leading. And then for Jake, he gets on the microphone as they're walking back into the tunnel. Again, this was just a brief vignette to lead up to the storytelling. And this is what I'm talking about, where he goes, bad stinger. And that Jake Roberts voice, you gotta love it. So it'll be interesting to see. And then they don't even finish the interview as Murder Hawk and Jake walk off. Sting gets so distracted and upset by it. Coming out of this match that they just had with Team Taz, he just walks off so I could see. Lance Archer and Sting, maybe, or Darby Allen setting up for something like that because they got to do something with, with, with the Murder Hawk monster. I don't think he's being used correctly. Just my opinion. So we'll see this story. You see, they're setting up all the storylines for this. Next, we have QT Marshall from the Nightmare Factory talking about all the stuff and the fallout from Revolution and how he left his partner in the Battle Royal, and that would be one Dustin Rhodes. Well, he's backstage with another student or uh, a rookie or uh, a greenhorn, so to speak, Lee Johnson from the Nightmare Factory, and they're interviewing him backstage, and they're trying to ask, uh, what happened with uh, Dustin Rhodes, and why'd you leave your partner? So that was the next segment. We'll skip past that. QT Marshall, Lee Johnson, the whole angle between QT and Dustin and, and the Nightmare Factory, and we'll see what happens with that. Next, we go on to the latest edition all ego Ethan Page was one of the additions on AEW Revolution. A lot of people were disappointed. It was Christian, this, that. Look at the guys. Like I said on show 44, they've added the big show, Paul White. They've added Christian. They've added all ego Ethan Page. you got to build up the roster. 
And let's not undercut Christian because that's all I keep hearing. They're trying to compare it to, oh, well, Edge is in the, the main event at WrestleMania against Roman Reigns. So this is Tony Khan trying to say, oh, well, Christian is our Edge and we're going to put him in the main event. It's all bullshit. It's all BS. And if it is, so what? But you're undercutting Christian. He's a true star, a true legend in this game. And is going to add, I think, to the roster. So is all uh, ego Ethan Page. And as you can see... Uh, this match, and, and I have to, I have to mention, I have to get onto it after the, Ethan Page against Lee Johnson from the QT Marshall Nightmare Factory. We just covered it. I'm repeating, but what happened during the Ethan Page Lee Johnson match? The unbelievable noise at Daly's place. It must have been coming from TNT, from the channel. I don't know what it was. It still hasn't been explained. But through the entire Ethan Page Lee Johnson match, there was a broadcast announcements, a replay, something throughout the whole arena that you could hear on TV. It drowned out the match, the sounds, the announcers. You could hear defense, defense, like it was from an NBA on TNT game. Unbelievable. They even went to commercial break and came back, and they still had the noise, and you couldn't hear anything but this NBA announcing and fans on, on some sort of uh, piped-in music or, or sound system. Unbelievable. And again, to the point of sloppiness, even at the highest of the high. Not an A ball, not an independent level at the highest of the high. Sometimes it just happens. The show must go on. People will shit on it. I understand. I get it. But it really was quite a distraction. The bottom line is Ethan Page uh, hit a so-called, I don't know, I guess we'll call it a razor's edge for the pin over Lee Johnson. And then out comes Dusty Rhodes. And as Dustin, Dustin... Oh, God bless Dusty Rhodes. That was a nice subliminal message right there. The American dream. Out comes Dustin Rhodes as QT just walks off into Daly's place into the arena. Uh, and he's gone. So we'll see where that story goes. But what I wanted to mention about that is, again, technical difficulties. Whether you're in the big leagues or the minor leagues. And a lot of people were talking about that. Social media was lit up last night. Then we go to Marvez. Alex Marvez, who seems to be... He's like a bad penny. Uh, he pops up everywhere, Alex Marvez. He's backstage with uh, Hangman Page, seeing how he's spending his money from Matt Hardy. Remember, the fallout from AEW Revolution, the big money match, first quarter earnings to the winner, and we know Hangman Page won. So he's backstage interviewing Hangman, who's sitting on a lawnmower, talking about, ah, well, I went out and got a brand new saddle, six bottles of whiskey, uh, I bought all the Dwight Yoakam on vinyl. Uh, I got a new lawnmower. And that's how he's spending Matt Hardy's money. And out of nowhere, here comes the entire Dark World Order. Dark Order. And they jump on a lawnmower and they're all partying. And uh, you can see what's going on there with Hangman Page and the Dark Order. And uh, you can't make it up. So that was a quite the entertaining vignette for Hangman Page. A gimmick of uh, being quite the partier. The late night man, if you will. We go back to Shivani at the tunnel, and he introduces the aforementioned Christian Gage. Very, very interesting what happens here. He comes out, and then Omega, Callus, and the Good Brothers, and they talk about the exploding barbed wire death match, the history of Mox, etc., Eddie Kingston, all the different things that they're talking about on there. It really, what, what they're doing with trying to tell the story. So Callus, Omega, and the Good Brothers are still in the ring saying that Mox and Kingston look like idiots because of the ending of the revolution. We all know what happened and we all talked about it. Out comes Eddie Kingston. So Christian is just basically hanging around. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Callus talks to Kingston when they were in, in, about when they were in pact. Calls Eddie a screw up. I tried to help you out. Uh, then the clock and the alarm, like the revolution mounts. Let me just make sure I got the notes quick here. The clock comes on, the sirens, the bells, just like in revolution with the big debacle that happened the other night. So they're replaying that incident right there with everybody in the ring. I just wanted to make sure. Shivani introduces Christian Cage. Omega Callus of the Good Brothers, talking about the exploding barbed wire death match, the history, Moxley, all that stuff. Okay. Shivani and Christian Cage, we go back to the 
just making sure, fans, that we have the accurate information. So they're in the ring, and they come out with the whole gimmick all over again from the exploding barbed wire death match. I really like how they tried to did this. A lot of people, again, weren't happy about it, but you have to explain it some way. I know I said earlier I would have handled it differently, but I like what they did to make it into a storyline. Then the clock and the alarms, as I said, from Revolution. Callus, Omega, and the Good Brothers start mocking Kingston after Callus just told him you were. I tried to help you out in Impact. Uh, you guys look like a bunch of clowns and idiots. Uh, uh, we saw earlier Mox and Kingston were trying to blame Impact for this, so, so here's the comeback from it. Then Omega antagonizes Eddie as all that, the whole fake alarms and, and countdown. <laughs> What's funny? Kingston lays out Omega, and then he gets bum-rushed, obviously, by Gallows and Anderson and, and, and Callis and everyone. And who comes out to help? His old buddy Moxley, and it becomes an all-out brawl. So you see what they're trying to do here with the whole impact, AEW connection. Moxley and Kingston hooking up again, fighting against Omega and the Good Brothers and the Invisible Hand and his impact pun intended, and everything that's going. This is where Christian Cage comes out. Cage comes out, very cerebral, laid back. I'm not sure if I like how laid back he's being. Looking for his peeps. He comes in. Omega's recovered as everyone's brawling outside. Omega sold the punch from Kingston, but then he gets up and he challenges Christian to the same thing, the same spot. And Christian lays him out. So you see now, and then... Omega tries to get back at him, but Callus pulls him out of the ring and says, not now, now. Omega's going crazy. Christian grabs the AEW title, lays it on the ring as Callus is dragging Omega away. And you see that they're setting up already for Christian Cage to come in and get a spot or a program with Omega. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not sure if I agree with this. I'm not sure if I like it. We should build up Christian a little bit. Just my opinion from my side of the storytelling, what I would do but I'm not getting paid to do this. That's why I'm on here doing this, because I'm not getting paid to do this. Just my opinion and my experience where I come from. I would have built Christian up a little bit, maybe put him in a, uh, a little feud with someone beforehand, but I guess they want to make an immediate hit on this. That's what I see coming out of that. I'm not sure if I like that. I think it's a little early for this angle, but it is for it is what it is. Next, uh, and I'm just going to skip over this. It really was uh, uh, all out chaos and havoc. Dr. Britt Baker with Reby, uh, Nyla Rose with Vicky Guerrero, Maki Itoi. I'll get onto that in a minute. They take on Thunder Rosa, Sheeta, the AEW Women's Champion, and Mizunami. Uh, listen, the only one that here that really needs a push, I believe is Thunder Rosa, although she is unbelievable. Britt Baker has really stepped it up. Mizunami's a J Japanese legend, but Itoi singing and dancing while the others are brawling. I get it. She's big in Japan. It doesn't work for me. I didn't even really want to mention it and cover it. And to me, and you could change the channel now or you could turn it down. This is your warning. If you don't like it, you don't want to hear it, I'm going to tell it like it is. The bottom line is Rosa pins Itoi. Thunder Rosa won. This match was for nothing. And then uh, Britt Baker attacks Rosa with, with the crutch because Reeby's still using the crutch angle. She ends up putting a lockjaw on Thunder Rosa, which this is where I want to see it go. Dr. Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa. I believe that's the matchup. Although all these other ladies are qualified. That's to my point. Five girls and one guy. Let's just call it like it is. Like, no, no offense against anyone. You don't like it, change it. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm telling it like it is. You don't like it. You don't have to listen. You could not follow. You could do whatever it is. To me, it's not fair. It's not right, whether it's in high school sports, scholastic sports, intercollegiate, uh, uh, NCAA, whatever you want to talk about, professionals. I don't think it's fair. You want to have all this different uh, transgender, intergender, different things, then have a separate category, have a separate class, uh, still keep it involved in inclusivity, but make it into a separate division. Because to me, it's just not fair. Five girls and a guy. You're competing with a guy with five other girls with strength, uh, biological, mental, whatever it is. Uh, just make up. And I don't think it's right. And I don't think it's fair. And I'm not judging anyone. You live your life how you want to live it. Uh, live and let live. Don't force it on me. I don't force nothing on you. But let's be honest and about it and make it fair and, and, and equitable for everybody if you're going to do this 
and I don't mean equitable like the government says equitable when it's supposed to be equ uh, equal. I don't mean that. I mean equal, not equitable, because people like to mix those terms up. Uh, equitable doesn't mean equal. Uh, and so that's what I mean. Make a separate division. Make it for that. And if you want to cross-compete, you make it up to the talent. But uh, I, I personally, this is my personal opinion, and I don't really like to throw it out there, but bottom line is Thunder Rosa will get a push. She went over on Itoi. I don't like the gimmick. And personally, what I think's happening with Rose is unfair. And I mean Nyla Rose. Just my opinion. Enough said. Now let's move on from that. And we'll go on to what we have next here at AEW Dynamite. Here are 40 minutes in. We're going to keep it under an hour for sure. A live to tape show number 45, if you will, with the Guardian of Chaos down in the bunker. And again, I can't thank you enough for being here. We'll get back to soon a complete Idiot's Guide to Pro Wrestling by Captain Lou Albano and Burt Randolph Sugar. A match made in heaven because I definitely want to continue to cover this before I get on to AEW Dynamite. We will be back with this book. I find it unbelievable. And if you're not reading it, you didn't get it, you're missing the boat. We get back to a vignette backstage with Matt Hardy and Private Party. No longer Big Money Matt Hardy. And they, they're, they're backstage and they're talking about Hangman Adam Page. And Matt Hardy's looking about how he can get even with the Dark World Order. The Dark Order, if you will. How he's going to get back at Hangman Page. We saw the vignette and earlier with Page in a Dark Order. And, uh, you know, Hardy's talking to private parties like, you know, I think we're going to sign somebody else. We need some help here. We're outnumbered. I got to get these guys. We're going to destroy them. And he brings out as his new additions the Butcher, the Blade, and the Bunny are now with Matt Hardy and Private Party. Private Party looked a little stunned and caught off guard. But you can see what AEW's doing. Starting to build factions. Whether it's the Inner Circle. Whether it's the alleged Bullet Club. Uh, whether it's going to be what MJF is doing now and they want to call it, and I'll cover that soon, the new Four Horsemen. Uh, Luchasaurus and the, uh, with Marco Stunt and and his faction and you know with with uh, uh, Jungle Boy, it, you see what they're trying to do here. Now you have the Dark Order, who's been there from the beginning, and there's twenty of them, three different tag teams in the in the Revolution Tag Team Battle Royal, and now you see that Matt Hardy, big money, no longer Matt Hardy's putting together a uh, faction. So you see what they're doing here, a la what WWE's done in the past and even back to WCW. So, excellent additions, I, I, I will say that. Next, we go on to what I've been looking forward to, and I mentioned on show 44, the TNT Championship. Uh, Scorpio Sky won the ladder match. We know that out of Revolution. An unbelievable bout. Uh, Darby Allen, who I'm hearing and reading, that was mostly the one who was responsible for a lot of the content in that uh, cinematic match, and they let him do a lot of the creative. A lot to be said for that. Darby Allen's got a pretty brilliant mind, if you ask me, for a young guy. So what a match. Again, excellent high-flying bout with two faces of the future of pro wrestling. I don't have to say any more than that. Okay, Scorpio Sky, Darby Allen, the TNT champion, two unbelievable athletes. Sky finally getting a shot. Uh, uh, been getting a good push in AEW. Darby, I uh, remember him from the Evolve Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling Evolve 95 Super Show right here in the Constitution State where with Keith Lee and Darby Allen and, and all the ilk from Evolve back then. Go back and check out Evolve 95, the Super Show between Evolve and Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling with everyone from Darby Allen to Keith Lee and Darby Allen that night for Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling. It was on iPay-Per-View. Got up into the rafters at the school down there, the home base of JMMS, up into the basketball hoop on top of the backboard, into the bleachers, and did a moonsaw, a dive, the coffin drop, so to speak, from the top of the basketball hoop and the top of the, the, the board, the backboard, onto all the, the stars from, from Evolve and PAPW. Unbelievable, Evolve 95. So this match didn't let down. Darby went for the coffin drop at the end, but Sky, Scorpio Sky countered into a power bomb from the top rope. It was an unbelievable move. That right there was the biggest move of the match. Sky also went for the TKO, but Darby 
rolled them up into a small package, surprise finish. Who knew after all these high-flying, dangerous maneuvers, and who knows about the longevity of Darby Allen, who was trying to be in Jackass as, a, as an actor and a stuntman. Dangerous stuff, Darby Allen, adrenaline junkie. Who knew that with a pack, small package roll-up for the pin is how we would win this match? So it really is something. Afterwards, and I like this angle, Scorpio Sky attacked Darby with a heel leg lock and he wouldn't let it go until all the refs came out. The refs finally had to break it up. Heel turn for Scorpio Sky? I believe so. Get away from SCU. Make this guy into a solo heel. I like it where Scorpio Sky. That's where I think it's trending. Then we go for a quick promo for the St. Patrick's Day Slam next week on AEW Dynamite. It's going to be a big card. So... Uh, Shivani, JR, and Excalibur are putting up all the graphics. St. Patrick's Day Slam next Wednesday on AEW Dynamite is going to be an unbelievable card. Here's partial lineup. John Moxley and Eddie Kingston take on the Impact Tag Team Champions, Gallows and Anderson, the Good Brothers. As we saw earlier and I discussed earlier in the show, Cody, the American Nightmare with Arn Anderson, takes on Penta. Zero Miero. That's going to be one hell of a match from the Lucha Brothers. Penta El Zero. I'm looking forward to that. The Jurassic Express and Bear Country, who I've been singing their praises for some time now, since they hit the scene in AEW as a new tag team, they take on Santana and Ortiz. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Again, I feel like I'm a part of AEW with a couple of mistakes here that I've had. I don't want to refer to Bully Ray again. Jurassic Express and Bear Country team up to take on Private Party and Butcher and the Blade, Matt Hardy's new acquisitions. That's where I was leading to. That's going to be an all-out match that you're not going to be able to, to witness or even call it. Uh, Eight-man tag team match? That ought to be one hell of a bout. And you know Marco Stunt and Hardy are going to be involved at some point. Also, we were looking forward to this as far as the women's division in AEW, which leads a lot to be desired, perhaps the weakest division in all of pro wrestling, Thunder Rosa takes on the doctor, Britt Baker, in the first ever ladies' main event for AEW. That's your main event for next week on Dynamite. The doctor, Britt Baker, against Thunder Rosa, and Jade Cargill returns to AEW Dynamite. So that's what you have next week for St. Patrick's Day Slam. That's the vignette they threw out last night on TNT. From there, we go into something that I've been waiting to cover and I talked about in the opening two minutes of this show. The Inner Circle War Council is in the ring now. Jericho, MJF, Santana, and Ortiz, and Hager shows up. But no Wardlow. And they're calling themselves an army. Jericho addresses the decline of the Inner Circle he says we need a new attitude, a new outlook, or maybe even a new member. MJF grabs the microphone and interrupts Jericho and says, uh, maybe we should let someone go instead of adding someone. Hit the music. In returning, Sammy Guevara hits the ring. The Spanish God, we haven't seen him in a while. You know the whole history of the inner circle and Sammy being booted. So Guevara comes out and he goes over to Jericho and asks him, he says, Chris... Just listen and watch. And Jericho said, ah, oh, you're a loser. You're a bum. You're out. Whatever the, the vignette and the promo is going on. And he says, no, no, no. Just watch, Jericho. And they show up a video on the, on the Tron. They show the inner circle in the dressing room with Santana, Ortiz, Hager, and MJF. And they're talking about setting up, maybe swerving, Jer not swerving, setting up. The swerve comes later. Setting up Jericho. MJF says, I hate to tell you this. It's not the way it's... I hate to tell you this way, Chris. But get them. After they showed a video for Santana and Ortiz and, and Hager to attack Jericho. Well, guess what happened? They didn't. They all went over there with Guevara and Jericho. Santana, Ortiz, and Hager. And MJF is on the other side of the ring with the microphone by himself. He thought he was setting up Jericho to take over. In turn, there was the swerve. And they as Sammy showed to Jericho, turned on MJF. You saw this coming. I called it weeks and weeks ago on shows in the past. But 
Santana, Ortiz, Hager, Sammy, like I said, they had to swerve on MJV, MJF. Jericho says, you don't think we talk as brothers? You don't think we're talking about you? You're fired. And now, you know what? You're going to get a beat down a la a good old boy style. And they attack MJF. And he said, no, no, no. Before they, I, I, I didn't want to take over. I, I didn't want to take over as they're ready to attack him. The lights go out. Which people are starting to use a lot now. Other organizations. WWE did it for years. Uh, Impact has done it. Uh, uh, ROH has done it. Every group a, a, has done it at one time or another. The lights go out. Lights come back on and standing behind the inner circle is Wardlow, FTR, Sean Spears, and Tully Blanchard. And here's where I got a little ahead of myself. An all-out brawl breaks out between Santana, Ortiz, Hager, Sammy, uh, M MJF uh, is sitting up on the ropes just watching everybody, sitting in the turnbuckle while... His boys of Wardlow, Spears, FTR, Tully Blanchard are brawling with Santana, Ortiz, Jericho, and Hager and Sammy. Unbelievable all-out brawl, and he's just sitting there and sitting there in MJF watching all this. So it went from double cross to, to swerve to set up all in one thing with the inner circle. Unbelievable. At one point, MJF gets off the rope, and he hits Jericho with the diamond ring. Remember, MJF is only 24, going to be 25 years old. This guy could be the new Ric Flair, like a lot of people are talking about. And, you know, you see Tully Blanchard, and they want to compare it to the new Four Horsemen. I don't know what the faction's going to be called, but that's what they want to call it. That's what people in the IWC were saying. The new faction's going to be the new Four Horsemen. Uh, I like it. You see what they're doing here in AEW. That's what happened there last night. And then that's how they that's how they ended up cutting it off. Jericho ended up being busted open. MJF attacks Jericho with a bat at the end. He leaves everybody laying out in the ring. But then Jericho and I don't want to keep saying the new four horsemen. Jericho and his faction pick up uh, MJF and his faction pick up Jericho out of the ring and they carry him out onto the stage. This is before the, after the lights go out, before they go fade to black. And this is how they keep people coming back to the tubes, coming back to the storylines. And come, this is what AEW is doing by building stars. They get Jericho out of the ring. Now everybody else is laid out. Wardlow, who's looking tremendous. I've been singing his praises also for a long time. He power bombs Jericho off the stage through a table. Unbelievable what happened in AEW last night to recover from the debacle and the ending of Revolution. Because besides the ending of the exploding ring, Revolution to me was a solid pay-per-view. Maybe a 7 out of 10, as I said. They worked hard. It was a good pay-per-view. Uh, that was a debacle. It'll be remembered in history. I understand. I get it. Maybe they shouldn't have tried it. But AEW Dynamite last night really covered it up. And after the lights went out, after the whole swerve, this is what I what I take out of the end of the thing. After the whole swerve, Jericho, uh, uh, MJF thinking he's setting up Jericho with the with the inner circle. Sammy returns, shows him the video. Uh, Jericho fires MJF, which you saw coming at one point or another, because MJF was trying to take over the inner circle. And then for that, him to say it's going to be an old fashioned beat down, and the lights go out, and then you see uh, Wardlow and. Blanchard and, and 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 I'll say it. I said I was going to say it. The new four horsemen behind them, and then for it to turn out to a brawl and to see MJF sitting back there as the architect of this whole design. He, this this kid is, is something. He's unbelievable uh, on what's happening. And then to carry it even further with the baseball bat and to bust Jericho open. No, he didn't get busted open the hard way. And then for them to just carry him out of the ring like that. I actually thought, and I said it last night, I thought they were going to kidnap him. So what do they do? Wardlow, again, looking tremendous. Power bomb off the stage, through the table. Fade to black. Guardian of chaos. Big Daddy. I tell it like it is. Show number 45. Live to tape. I'll say that to say this. This is my fade to black. I'll be back. Don't you dare miss it.